A century after the Great Exhibition of 1851, Margaret Gold grew up in a London where the event's legacy still loomed large. You were always aware that there had been a great exhibition. It's very much embedded into London's history. The v the Science Museum, the Natural History Museum, the Royal Albert Hall and the Albert Memorial. So this was somewhere you kind of visited um, on days out, that kind of thing. It was a really important part of most families' um, leisure time, really. Today, Margaret teaches cultural tourism and events management at London Metropolitan University. Her husband, John, is a professor of urban historical geography at Oxford Brookes University. And together, they wrote Festival Cities, Culture, Planning and Urban Life, a book about mega events and the cities that host them. Generally, a world expo lasts six months. But planning for it from the bid phase all the way up to the opening ceremony, well, that can take around a decade. And the impact it makes on a city can last for centuries. They are very large events which require a great deal of planning. It will involve government, it will involve industry, involve important groups within the population, possibly groups in areas which might be affected by the the way the showground is going to be. It's this fascination with the way in which they engage with the regular processes of planning a city, which makes them a very interesting thing to, to see. Today, we're going back in time to take a closer look at past Expo host cities. How did they think about the city as a whole when designing an Expo site? What have they sought to preserve and what's changed forever? And how do communities carry the memory of such an enormous event? In this episode, the first of a two-part series on Expo legacies, we're bringing you two stories about two very different Expo experiences, one in London and one in Lisbon. They take place more than a century apart, but at their core is Expo's tradition of harnessing big ambitions and its desire to push innovation further than ever imagined. I'm Noon Saleh, and this is Inside Expo, an official podcast of Expo 2020 Dubai, where history is being made. Our story starts in London, in the first half of the 19th century. Well, I guess London had been growing very dramatically. It had developed as one of the world's major ports. Um, It had benefited from the growth of the railway network. It was now very much firmly connected, not just to the rest of the UK, but to Europe and further afield. Um, You have the pace of industrialisation picking up and industrial innovation taking place. And there was this desire to showcase what was being achieved. Around the same time in Paris, the great exhibition of products of French industry was taking place every few years. A man named Henry Cole had been watching the success of the Paris event closely, and he managed to get Prince Albert on board to establish the Royal Commission for the Great Exhibition of 1851. Their goal was to organize a large event in London that established Britain as the leader of industry. It was a showpiece for the preeminence of British industry. But there was also this sense of the world comes to one place. And the commission quickly came to realize that in order for the whole world to come to one place, that place needed to be spacious enough to accommodate tens of thousands of people in a single day. It had to be big. So they landed on Hyde Park. This was right on the edge of London. And we tend to think of parks as a sort of contained spaces surrounded by urban development. But of course, it wasn't like that. It was a royal park which was isolated and there were still sheep being grazed in it. So you're almost part of the countryside here. Today, we tend to think of expo sites as cities within larger cities. And they usually require acres and acres of land to be altered or completely developed from the ground up. But back in those early years, the space that would hold the event was seen as a temporary one. And so in London, the question became, how do you build a structure at the center of Hyde Park that changes the park as little as possible, but can also host such a large event? The pavilion itself was a most interesting 
affair. The key architect of it was not a professional architect at all. He was a gardener known as Joseph Paxton. And the way in which the the building was created was to create this, what is essentially a huge greenhouse, big enough to take in some of the trees which were not allowed to be cut down and to create a large demountable structure in the centre of London. The size of it would have been quite staggering to people at the time because a lot of building in London was not terribly high and this single structure of glass sparkling, the light inside was quite dramatic. The key word is spectacle, that you not only have exhibits which draw people in, but you have a container, a, a, a building, a construction which really creates this sense of awe amongst the people who come there. And the, the, undoubtedly, the Crystal Palace had that effect. The Great Exhibition took place over six months, from May to October 1851. And the Crystal Palace was home to 14,000 exhibitors and was visited by more than six million people. Queen Victoria described her first time seeing the palace overflooded with visitors as a, quote, sensation she will never forget. The writer Charlotte Bronte was quoted saying, It's a wonderful place, vast, strange, new, and impossible to describe. Its grandeur does not consist in one thing, but in the unique assemblage of all things. It must be stressed that it was a, always intended that this would be removed. There was a little thought after the Great Exhibition that this huge glass uh, construction could be retained there, but the intention was that it would be there for the exhibition and then removed afterwards, which eventually it, it was. When the exhibition finished, there was very little idea of what was going to happen next. There was no sense of what should come after. Our concerns with legacy is a much more recent thing. After the Great Exhibition ended, there was the idea that maybe the Crystal Palace could be kept in Hyde Park, but that was quickly shut down and it was decided that the structure would be relocated to Sydenham Hill in South London. And on June 10th, 1854, its doors opened once again to visitors who wanted to enjoy art installations, science exhibitions, a circus show, and outdoor concerts. But without the Great Exhibition, the Crystal Palace lost its appeal. Each year, less and less people visited, and it was never able to bring in enough money to cover the cost of its maintenance. And eventually, in 1936, the building was destroyed. At about 8 o'clock, the fire started at the Sydenham end. Within five minutes, it was blazing. Tragically, it burns down. And certainly, I remember my mother talking to me about the destruction of Crystal Palace. To few people in a lifetime comes the chance of seeing such a gigantic blaze as the funeral pyre of the Crystal Palace, the proudest building of the last century, one of the few remaining links with Queen Victoria and Prince Albert. It was something which they seemed to be aware of um, when it actually happened and were quite affected, actually, by the scale of the disaster when it burnt down. The palace firemen did what they could, but it was obviously hopeless, and all the might of London's firefighting equipment can do little more than delay the inevitable destruction. Unlike Expos Today, which can take up hundreds of buildings, the Great Exhibition was housed in just one large building, the Crystal Palace. So when it burned down to many people, it felt like the last tangible memory from the Great Exhibition was gone. And yet we know now that the Great Exhibition did leave behind a legacy, even if it was an accidental one. So what happened exactly? The important thing about the Great Exhibition was it made a profit. And that profit needed to be dispersed somewhere. And they came, had various schemes. And eventually, and only eventually, they came up with a scheme for the South Kensington Quarter. A plot of land was bought in South Kensington, just west of central London, using the profits made from the event. It came to be known as the Cultural Quarter, or Exhibition Road. It would take quite a while before the development takes place, but gradually you have the building of new roads, the laying out of the new institutions, and the transformation into this, this cultural and education quarter. When you go there today, you, you have your own local, uh, well, mass transit station, South Kensington Station is on the underground. You can get there very easily. Your overall sense that when you get there is of excited people, particularly children. It's a place where you, children visit, they go to the museums. 
But for, for adults, the, the events in the Albert Hall, the, the, the promenade concerts. So this is an area which has really has a really positive uh, sense of it. It wasn't intentional legacy. It wasn't there from the start. It wasn't there uh, in the in the late 1840s. People didn't say, "Look, let's have a great exhibition, and after it, we will we will be able to create this cultural quarter." It came about through a process of looking at what was available and seeing the opportunities that were there. At the end of the 20th century, 147 years after the Great Exhibition, Lisbon was awarded the Expo in 1998. And by that time, Expo sites were no longer seen as something that stood at the periphery of a city. And the question of what would happen to a site after Expo was no longer just an afterthought. The importance is about what today is called a legacy. So we need uh, to deliver something that is not the Expo itself. This is Luis Miguel Rodriguez. Today, he lives and works in Dubai. But between 1995 and 2012, he was the head of the environmental and urban management divisions at Parquet Expo, the company that was created to design, build and repurpose Lisbon's Expo site. The final goal that was to have a new city, a new downtown, a livable city that was planned to be achieved around 2010. But we knew that meanwhile, in 1998, we had to accommodate an expo. By that time, Lisbon was um, a kind of a, a unbalanced city in terms of development. So we had by that time the western part of Lisbon that was let's call it a more developed area with a lot of touristic places and attractions uh, and everyone was going there. On the other side we had the eastern part of Lisbon that was a kind of the dump site. In Lisbon, the expo site was built on a strip of land which was at the time made up of industrial dockyards, abandoned lots and slaughterhouses. But this contaminated brownfield also happened to stretch along five kilometers of the Tagus River front. So it was a, a very uh, a kind of a prime location, but in a very degraded situation that required the intervention to be recovered uh, and to be requalified and to be given back to the to the citizens of Lisbon. The idea, especially of those who knew the area before the expo, obviously was uh, very very bad, and it was very uh, challenging to convince them that was uh, that will become. Uh, a, a reference part of the city and a good place to live and to work. The most critical part of planning for this future Lisbon was actually earning people's trust. And this process started even before the expo. Parquet Expo was not only revamping the area, it was also organizing shows and other attractions in the lead up to the big day, so the public can get a glimpse of what's to come. We were able to join a team of very talented people uh, in all areas, uh, in culture, in architecture, in urban planning. There were, I can say, visionaries and much ahead uh, of their time. I think it's important to have a long-term vision in, let's say, 10, 20 or 30 years' time. That vision needs to be something that is, uh, respects the, the, the identity uh, of the city, but the, the, the cities as well, they cannot be static. They need to, uh, to evolve. There is a natural evolution of all cities and of all places. The theme of the expo was the oceans, a heritage for the future. And that became a mantra, repeated over and over when thinking about how the site would be designed and how it would be used after the event ended. For example, Portugal's largest indoor aquarium was built back in 98 as an expo attraction. And to this day, it attracts more than a million tourists every year. On the 22nd of May, if I'm not wrong, of 98, the expo opened uh, and people start going there. It was a huge success and, and everyone, it was a big celebration. Uh, after that, uh, we knew that uh, we had, uh, let's call it uh, the second stage. After tomorrow, this has to be a new part of the city. This wasn't an easy task, but for those who study expos, Lisbon is a tale of exemplary urban planning. The fr riverfront is now a free area where people can walk and enjoy the area. Uh, we have also some uh, uh, green areas and the expo site is one of the best areas in Lisbon today. Early foresight to build underground infrastructure for utility world meant there was little disruption to life above ground. The site became a busy transit hub, with trains and buses connecting the rest of the city to the newly built Gare de Oriente. 
And much of the architectural marvels continue to be landmarks today. And in the case of Lisbon, timing was also key. Portugal was coming out of economic struggle and finally entering the European Union. Rolando Martins, who led the urban development efforts for Lisbon 98 and is chief operations officer at Expo 2020 Dubai, says, and I quote, we are becoming the capital that wanted to be part of a larger group of capitals. Context is important when thinking about how expos are built and about the afterlives of the spaces they occupy. This balancing act between an expo and its host city is what Ronaldo calls a dialogue between the structures that are constructed and the pre-existing urban tissue. We should not think separately of the event and the legacy, he says. The event is just a moment, not the end. Here's Luis again. That physical legacy, I think definitely it was one, one key issue. The other one, and I think that I already mentioned, is about the change in the mindset. Before the expo, um, the public spaces was a, lot, was a kind of, well, this is not my home. And after that, people start feeling that the public space is also my home. So that is something that I really need to take care of. Uh, at the end of the day, public space is the area where everyone gets together. The richest and the poorest, uh, the educated, the not educated, everyone gets together uh, in the public space. So that is our common home. Expos like the one in Lisbon can be powerful catalysts for cosmopolitan change. And Luis says Expo 2020 is preparing to create its own legacy. That will be the new Dubai. Everyone has been looking for Dubai for many years as a major success in terms of development. And then again, and finally, is the message that you want not only for Dubai, but for the international community. Uh, the message about the concerns about opportunity, uh, opportunity to change, to make a real change, about uh, sustainability, about uh, about mobility and about climate change, and to look forward and especially to give uh, a positive message about the future. Next, in part two of our series exploring Expo's impact on host cities, we'll talk to the team behind Expo 2020's legacy vision and learn about their plans for District 2020 in Dubai. Inside Expo is an official podcast of Expo 2020 Dubai, connecting minds, creating the future. Learn more by visiting virtualexpodubai.com. Inside Expo is produced by Kerning Cultures Network. We release episodes every Tuesday and Friday. Subscribe to Inside Expo on your favorite podcast app so you don't miss an episode. If you enjoyed the show, share it with your friends and leave us a review. 